So thank you all for joining this research webinar. Our host, our host today is uh, the CTL Center, which is the Center for Transportation and Logistics at the IIM Ahmedabad. And we are very honored to host uh, Dr. Mike Hevitt. As you know, this uh, CTL Center offers uh, research webinars in quarterly or every bi-monthly. And we are trying to address research problems and address the larger themes of both transportation and logistics. Uh, today, we're very excited to have with us uh, Professor Mike Hevitt from the Loyola uh, College, Chicago. So his talk today is on consolidation-based modeling for transportation service network design problems. So let me give you a bit of background about Dr. Hevitt. He's a professor of supply chain management in the Quillen School of Business at Loyola University of Chicago. He also serves as a faculty director of its Supply Chain and Sustainability Center. Uh, Dr. Hevitt research includes developing quantity models of decision-making processes found in the transportation and supply chain management domains, particularly in freight transportation and home delivery. Uh, I Myself, I know about research work. He has published several articles in top tier journals, including OR, Transmission Science, Informed Journal of Computing, and several others. He also collaborates on research projects with individuals and universities around the world and that involves solving several practical problems from Bayer Corp Science, ExxonMobil, uh, Schneider, LA Roadways, and many others probably. His research has also been funded by agencies such as NSF, the Metal Handling Institute, the New York State Health Foundation, and several others. And from what I know of Mike, he is very, very instrumental in developing the TSL Society at INFORMS, which is the Transmission Science and Logistics, it's a flagship society that hosts several uh, hundreds of transportation logistics enthusiasts across the world. And I was very, very honored to support him in some of the endeavors that he had pursued during his uh, role at TSL. And I'm sure he's still going on doing that. And before entering the PhD program at Georgia Tech, uh, he also worked as a software engineer, which brings him several real life challenges on development side, also while he's solving uh, the optimization problems. Just to know his expertise is in solving large scale optimization problems and also structurally modeling in such a way that the problem is kind of simplified and it can be structurally exploited and you can get faster solution in shorter time with better accuracies and computational efficacies. Great. So with that, I will give the whole floor to rather the Zoom to Mike. Mike, all is yours. <laughs> Thank you, Debji. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to talk about this project. Uh, thank you for mentioning TSL. So if you're not aware, TSL is the Transportation Science and Logistics Society of Informs. Uh, and I, I was the president, I'm not now, but we really do engage, try and engage in researchers interested in these topics around the world. In particular, one way in which TSL tries to do that is to fund grants. Uh, this project in particular is actually funded by a cross-regional grant with myself and a colleague and collaborator in France, Fabien Louis. So I'm going to be talking about uh, what I've called consolidation-based modeling uh, for freight transportation service network design problems. Uh, my primary uh, bread and butter, if you will, is freight, and in particular, LTL freight. So what we're talking about here is a consolidation carrier, right? Uh, FedEx, UPS, DHL, I'm sure uh, many of those companies uh, engage in transportation in India, and I'm sure there's local ones as well. The idea behind such a carrier, it's a pretty straightforward business model, right? I pick up shipments in an origin, I deliver them to a destination. The key feature is that typically these shipments are small relative to vehicle capacity, say maybe one or two pallets, right? And I have a time and day at which I have to pick them up uh, and I have a time and day at which I have to deliver them, right? So, so nothing too surprising here if you know anything about logistics, right? And in particular, right, if you wanna make money operating this kind of business, right, then what you really have to do is consolidate shipments, right? So just to drive the point home, right, we have two pictures here, right, both trailers, both with pallets. If I'm looking at this from the carrier perspective, right, I'm probably going to make money on this move, right, because the trailer is well utilized. This one, maybe not. I mean, of course, the pricing plays a role, but utilization or sometimes load factor, which is also a metric used in air, uh, it kind of tells you how well you're doing. Of course, the way this consolidation happens uh, is by having shipments from different customers with potentially different origins and destinations transported in the same vehicle, right? 
And that, as you may know, some of this may be review for, for many of you. Uh, so I apologize if it's too basic, but I just kind of like to make sure we're all starting from, from the same, same base, baseline. But as you're probably aware, or you've seen, and you also see this kind of network structure in many modes, right? So you see this in air as well, right? Where you've got hubs and whatnot, right? The way a consolidation carrier achieves high vehicle utilization, right? Is by basically having spokes that serve as consolidation points for freight that originates in a single region. Right. You have hubs that serve as consolidation points for freight that's coming from uh, multiple regions or, or freight uh, pallets, if you will, that are coming from different regions and then also destined for different regions. And then, of course, folks can also serve as consolidation points on, on the delivery side as well. Now, the way these problems are or these operations, I should say, are typically planned uh, is at two levels, if you will. Right. So and from an optimization perspective, right, we would think about two different optimization problems. Right. The local pickup and delivery operation. So what does that mean? That means if you think about the UPS driver coming to your house, that's local delivery, right? So local pickup and delivery, right, is you've got small vehicles or smaller vehicles, right, going to and from customer sites, right, to pick up and deliver pallets, whatever, right? That's often optimized by solving some kind of vehicle routing problem or pickup and delivery problem. May have time windows, may have other factors or features, uh, et cetera. And then my uh, area of expertise, if I can uh, be so, so bold, if you will, is more about what could be considered middle mile logistics. And in particular, the optimization of freight through the, the network itself. And this is generally solved or, or planned, at least academically speaking, but also in practice by solving some kind of service network design problem. And so that's what I'm gonna talk about uh, a little bit today. Now, again, this is probably uh, a little redundant and maybe it's, it's somewhat obvious, but I feel like it's, again, important to kind of lay uh, the, the groundwork, if you will, right? And it's important to recognize that consolidation doesn't involve or require just having shipments, paths that consolidate or coordinate in space, but also in time, right? So here I've got two shipments, right? Both with the same destination. I apologize, I'm somewhat US centric with my examples. I hope that's gonna be okay. Right, and obviously you can see that they both overlap, right, in these last two moves, right? But of course, uh, for consolidation to really happen, they would actually have to dispatch from Atlanta at the same time, and then they'd have to dispatch from Tampa at the same time, the shipments that is, to be able to travel in the same vehicle, okay? So time is a critical factor when trying to model the movement of freight through these through networks, right, and to achieve consolidation. And so that's why folks will often solve what's known as the scheduled service network design problem. Uh, this is a, an optimization problem that's been studied for quite a while, probably about uh, since about early 1990s. The idea here in a sort of clear problem description way, if you will, is you have a network of nodes and arcs. Each arc has a capacity and a fixed cost per, per execution or installation. So arcs generally model vehicle movements. You have commodities that you want to route through that network. Each commodity has a time it's available at its origin terminal and a time it's due at its destination terminal. And what you want to do is you want to determine a physical path for each commodity through the network, right? Basically from its origin to its destination. And you also want to determine uh, a schedule of dispatch times for each commodity on each arc in its path. Right. And these have to agree, of course, when it's available and when it's due, as well as with the travel time. Uh, within uh, between on uh, moves in the network. And then, of course, you have to have vehicles to move your, your, your stuff, if you will. And the goal, generally speaking, uh, is to minimize your total vehicle transportation costs. There are, of course, other factors that people will consider in the in models like this. So, for example, driver usage, the need to move uh, vehicles empty. Uh, and there's there's variants of the scheduled service network design problem that consider that. But we're not going to really get into that in much detail here. So I'm not going to go into a tremendous amount of detail regarding this model, but if, if you're familiar, right, this is sort of the classical way of modeling this kind of this problem, if you will, right? So I use a time expanded network, right, where I have physical locations that are replicated in time, right? So for example, I've got node T4 here, right, and I've got time copies of it that represent different activities at that physical location at different points in time, right? Similarly, I have arcs where I have time copies of those arcs, say, for example, T4 to T3, right? And what does that represent? That represents that dispatch from terminal T4 to terminal T3 at different points in time, right? And that's how I capture the time component of this planning problem. 
And then once you have the time expanded network, it's fundamentally a network design problem, right? I have Y variables that measure how many vehicles I use, and I have X variables that measure or, or represent basically how my freight flows through my network. There's of course variance here, right? Oftentimes you'll see the X variables will be binary, right? What that would represent is do I take this physical move or not, right? That's if I want my shipments or pallets to travel on a single path. Practically speaking, I'd say that's more common, but the more classical network design problem allows you to split uh, your, your commodities along multiple paths. So this is what many people, myself included, have been working on in this area for quite a while. Uh, and there's three computational challenges associated with solving this problem. There's more than three, but there's three I'm gonna kind of focus on uh, today. The first uh, is that of course, this notion of copying uh, elements of your network, be they nodes, be they arcs, right? For different points in time, right? Can lead to extremely large networks, right? Uh, in particular, if you're looking at a long planning horizon, or you're looking at a fine representation of time, right? So the idea is that these time points represent maybe hours, maybe days, but more and more with same day delivery and the need for rapid uh, transit of goods, right? The way you represent time becomes more important. Now this challenge has been somewhat addressed by a paper I, I worked on with, with some folks a couple of years ago uh, by this, with this framework we proposed called dynamic discretization discovery. I'm not gonna talk about that today, but it's, it's one way of addressing this challenge of time expanding networks getting too big. Another challenge associated with solving this kind of problem has to do, is more of an integer programming issue, right? So the idea is we model capacity or the need for capacity in this classical formulation with knapsack type constraints, right? So what does that mean? So on my left-hand side, right, I'm summing up how much volume I need. On my right-hand side, I've got a coefficient that represents the capacity per vehicle multiplied by the number of vehicles I use. Now, in practice, right, the Y variables represent uh, vehicle movements, right, and the X variables represent shipment flows, right, and so in particular, the cost coefficient associated with the Y variables is typically much, much larger than, than the C's, if you will, right, so the C's would represent like a per kilogram incremental cost uh, on a physical move, right, which is generally very, very small compared to the, to the F uh, coefficient, which is going to capture fuel usage, maybe driver needs, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not hard to imagine. And if you, if you know or remember a little bit about uh, linear programming, right? effectively these models and these capacity constraints lead to very fractional uh, solutions to the LP, linear programming relaxation. And so what that means is it's not hard to construct examples right? without any additional features such as valid inequalities or whatnot where you have extremely large gaps because these knapsack inequalities are fundamentally quite weak. And then the last challenge uh, associated with using this sort of time expanded network based formulation, right, is symmetry, right? So symmetry is another feature or aspect of many integer programs that makes them quite hard to solve, right? And time expanded networks tend to introduce a lot of symmetry in these models. So what do I mean by symmetry? Well, here's a small little example, right? So I've got my commodity that takes this path. The path is in red, right? The commodity itself only need is only has five units of size and my capacity is 10. So my LP solution is naturally going to just pay for half the vehicle because that's all the LP thinks it needs. What would a, an IP solver do? Well, it, it would branch that fractional Y variable down to zero. Right. And now what's going to happen probably at the child node? Well, it's basically just going to shift that path a little bit in time. Right. And so now I've still got a solution with a fractional Y value of the exact same amount. Right. And effectively branching hasn't done anything for me. Right. So basically I'm right back where I started. Uh, and, and this is a real problem. Right. So oftentimes when you see network people or you look at solution logs, to be quite frank, for network design problems, uh, you'll see that once you go past the root node, you, you don't make much progress. So these are sort of the three challenges that we're gonna present, or I'm gonna present a slightly different, well, not slightly, a fairly different modeling paradigm that will kind of get us away from these three challenges uh, or help mitigate these three challenges, if you will. Uh, but to do that, we're gonna start with a, a simpler problem that actually was motivated by uh, an industrial collaboration. Um, should I ask for questions or do you want me to just keep going? I'm fine either way. Devjeet, what? Yes, if, if anybody has questions, please uh, post them in the chat or the Q&A and we'll moderate it. Yeah, okay, great. 
So in particular, uh, this was a project with a, an LTL company headquartered in Wisconsin in the US. Uh, they had a fairly small network, actually, about 25 terminals, and they're basically moving furniture around. So it was interesting in the fact that their lead times were super long, uh, which is not generally what you think about these days. But so the idea behind this problem uh, is I've still got my network. I've still got my commodities that I have to route through that network. But now I've already determined through some other planning process the path that each commodity is going to take through that network. Okay, and I'll talk a little bit more about what, where, why this might happen. Uh, but so what you're left with fundamentally is a scheduling problem, right? So I know the physical moves for each commodity. Now all I need left to optimize is the time at which each commodity dispatches on each arc in its path, and of course I still need to dispatch my vehicles. Okay. And the goal is still to minimize my, my transportation costs. So if you think about it, going back to our example, right, I've got these two shipments. In this case, actually, I've got three shipments, right? Uh, and I've got paths for each one that, again, have already been given to me, right? Fundamentally, what my optimization problem is, is to determine the dispatch schedule, right? So it's just, like I said, it's a scheduling problem. Now, the inspiration for this problem, uh, which in part I liked because it's simple to describe, at least I think it is, uh, is that the classical scheduled service network design problem, what I talked about earlier, is generally thought of as a tactical planning problem, right? So I'm going to determine my network, right, on a quarterly basis, on a seasonal basis, maybe on a monthly basis, right? And what's solving that problem going to give me? It's going to give me my physical paths for my shipments, more precisely between origin and destination pairs, right? And then it's also going to give me schedules. Now, in some modes, right, you may have to really adhere to both those paths and those schedules. But in other modes, in particular trucking and in particular LTL, which is was the motivation for this project, right, you may be able to have some, you may have some flexibility in the schedules, right, while you want to keep the paths the same, right, for operational reasons, right? So uh, I don't know, well, I, I can only speak to US transportation companies, but there's still a great number of them where the terminals and warehouses and cross docks are not digital, right? And so changing the paths that freight takes through the network, right, is not a trivial operation. So you wanna kind of set up the terminal, right, for the paths in particular like doors, for example, right? So freight that's going to Chicago needs to go to that door, going to Atlanta needs to go to that door, right? You don't wanna have to change that on a regular basis. Well, well on a too frequent a basis, I should say, right? And so you wanna keep the paths the same, but you're willing to change the schedules, okay? And so that's essentially where this problem problem came from. So from a, a graphical perspective, if you wanna think about it that way, right? The thinking was, and what this carrier was interested in doing was solve this more tactical problem on, in that case, actually a monthly basis, and then solve the scheduling problem on a weekly basis when you've got a more accurate forecast of volumes. So it's not hard to think about uh, a time expanded network formulation for this problem, and that's pretty straightforward to do. Well, what's different that we've done here and what is actually seeming to be fairly promising is to not use a time expanded network at all and instead enumerate consolidations of shipments uh, or have a formulation that's based upon enumerations of consolidations, uh, which is sometimes hard for me to say enumerations of consolidations, but that's that's the idea, right? And we're going to propose two solution methods for each of these formulations. Uh, the time expanded network is fairly straightforward, but we have two purposes in mind. One, we just want to compare the formulations, like is this consolidation based idea stronger in like an integer programming way? And then we have a dynamic method that we can use to solve larger instances, uh, really of both, but in particular of the consolidation based one and very, very quickly. So for a time expanded network formulation, it's super straightforward. Think about the scheduled service network design problem, but I can basically take some arcs away because I already know the paths for each commodity. So that's, that's super simple. You can be a little bit smarter. Uh, so in particular, we had proven this uh, proposition uh, in that paper about DDD a few years ago, and we can adapt that to our problem. Now, ignoring all that math, right, because the logic is, is fairly straightforward, what, what we can say about this service network scheduling problem is that the only nodes you need in your time expanded network are ones that represent terminals at times that are the earliest at which some commodity could reach that terminal. If you build a time expanded network with just those and solve the, the, the MIP, if you will, or IP, depending on your formulation, boom, you're done. 
So to give you an idea of what that looks like, so we have three commodities. Let's look at commodity one. It originates at location A at time one, so we would need that node. We already know its path, that it goes to location B next, and it takes a travel time of one, so we'd need that node. Then it continues on to C, which needs travel time of one, or has a travel time of one, so we need that node. Now we can move on, and also we need its destination node, pardon me. For commodity two, it becomes available at location B at time four, so I need that node. It would then go to location C, but I've already got that node, so I don't have to do anything with it. And then it continues on to D. For commodity three, it becomes available at location A at time one. I've already got that node. It then continues through B and C, and then ultimately I just need its destination node. So whereas an enumeration would have yielded 28, uh, oh, I need that one too, sorry. Uh, whereas an enumeration would have yielded 28 nodes if I just basically enumerated every location, every point in time, right? Here, I really only need eight, right? So, so that's the idea. And if you do this, you'll have a, a formulation that will yield the optimal solution, even though you didn't enumerate every single time. But so that's fine and good. That's nothing, uh, and, and it works reasonably well, but not as well as what I'm going to present next. And in particular, the idea here is if I have each of my shipments, and this is data, right? And I have the path that they're gonna take, right? Again, I've solved some other optimization problem, in particular, the scheduled service network design problem to give me the paths that freight takes through my network. And I know when they're available and when they're due, right? Then for each commodity or shipment, on each physical move in its path, I can determine a time window, right? And from those time windows, I can then determine potential consolidations of commodities on each physical arc in my network, okay? So fairly straightforward, you know, if I know that shipment one has to dispatch from Chicago to Atlanta on Monday uh, between 12 and two, and I know that shipment two uh, has to dispatch from Chicago to Atlanta on Monday between one and three, right? They overlap between one and two o'clock. So you could potentially have a consolidation there. That's, that's the whole idea. Now, what's nice about this uh, from an integer programming perspective is once I've enumerated these consolidations, so what does a, uh, a consolidation mean, right? It means a set of shipments that are going to travel together, right? Then what we can do is we can a priori determine how many vehicles you would need to transport that consolidation. So you remember that example I gave you regarding the LP relaxation being quite weak because of the knapsack inequalities? right, to, to capture uh, capacity needs, that kind of goes away, or at least we strengthen that quite a bit. Another actually nice feature uh, about, which I'm not really going to talk about in detail, but about modeling with consolidations, is that uh, the classical knapsack type constraint, right, is really just an aggregate capacity constraint, right? In reality, when I have my shipments and I have my vehicles moving, uh, I need to solve some kind of bin packing problem, right? Because the shipments may not neatly pack. Basically, those aggregate knapsack constraints assume that you can divide a shipment across multiple vehicles, right? With our consolidation-based formulation, you could, you could get away from having to do that. But regardless, <coughs> once we've enumerated these consolidations, and we've determined how many vehicles each consolidation would need, we can formulate our scheduling problem purely on a physical network, meaning we don't have to do any of that copying of nodes and copying of arcs like we would if we used a time expanded network. So just to give you a sense of what the formulation looks like, right? So we've got three sort uh, sets of decision variables. The first is whether or not we choose a given consolidation for a given arc, pardon me, the second, the gammas are the dispatch time of a commodity on each arc in its path. Uh, and then the third is just the number of vehicles we need on an arc. And in this case, an arc is a physical arc, right? Chicago to Atlanta, no, no time index. My objective is straightforward, right? My first set of constraints basically says that uh, for a given commodity and a given arc in its path, I have to choose a consolidation that contains it, right? Now note, my set of consolidations includes singletons. So the consolidation chosen for a commodity on an arc in its path could just include itself. Secondly, right, this constraint simply says that we need to have enough vehicles on an arc. Sometimes I like to call them lanes because that's the way at least folks in, in transportation in the US describe them in terms of physical moves, I mean. 
uh, you need sufficient vehicles to transport the consolidations chosen. So to be clear, you can choose multiple consolidations per lane, right? I could have one consolidation that goes on Monday between Chicago and Atlanta and another one that goes on Wednesday. Here, uh, we have a constraint that says that if I choose a consolidation that contains two commodities, well, that contain, yeah, right, that contains two commodities, it could contain more, then they must dispatch at the same time. Now, traditionally, you would worry from an engine programming perspective about using a constraint like this because of this big M value, right? Big Ms are typically quite bad, right? But here, because we have the time windows, if you will, right, for when each commodity can dispatch on each arc in its path, we can actually derive fairly tight values for these big M's. So we don't have to use a billion or a, a 10,000 or whatever, unless of course the time windows really are that wide, which that naturally speaking wouldn't be the case. And then these are just simply constraints that say that my dispatch times have to agree with my travel times. And these say they have to agree with my time windows. It's not hard to show that this formulation is equivalent to the simple time expanded network formulation. Uh, and, and, that, and that's just true. So first we just wanted to see this whole, this new formulation idea using consolidations, does it even make sense, right? So from an integer programming perspective, can we solve instances faster, right? So I, we have a, a network from a US LTL carrier. Uh, like I said earlier, it's not really that big. It's about 25 terminals. Well, it's not that big if you think about like a UPS is what I'll say. Uh, we varied our instances in number of commodities, as well as the widths of delivery windows, and we considered a few benchmarks. And so what we see here, so most importantly, I think is the orange, uh, I hope none of you are colorblind, but it's the orange bars, right? So that's our consolidation based formulation. What we see basically is that solving that formulation allows us to solve more instances and generally speaking in quite a bit less time. As you can probably imagine, while the consolidation-based formulation performs much better, it does worse uh, or it struggles as you have larger numbers of commodities, right? And this isn't so surprising, right? The idea behind this formulation is you're enumerating these consolidations a priori, right? And that's, of course, going to be time consuming. But before getting into that issue of enumerating them a priori, we next wanted to think about, well, why does this formulation seem to do better when it does? Right. The hypothesis, right, part of the motivation for this formulation was that using these constraints based upon enumerated, uh, the vehicle needs associated with enumerated consolidations, right, will be much stronger than using these knapsack type constraints. And in fact, that turns out to be true. So we ran a set of experiments where basically we just solved the LP relaxation of each instance, compared the value of that, uh, of the solution of the LP relaxation with the integer programming optimal solution. Right, and the, the, the LP relaxation is producing much, much stronger bounds, right? So about 5% to down to 1.6%. Of course, we pay in terms of how long it takes to solve because the instances tend to be quite a bit bigger. And of course, enumerating the consolidations takes a bit of time as well. Um, mind you, I programmed this in Python, right? With a faster language like C++, right? It, you may reduce this a little bit, but of course this a priori enumeration, you can only take so far. So uh, in terms of where we are with respect to this idea, right, it seems clear or we're comfortable in saying that this formulation idea is good, but this isn't a surprise. You'd see the same thing with the vehicle routing problem and route-based formulations, right? The formulation is strong, but the idea of enumeration is bad, right? Now, of course, what you do in vehicle routing, which we could consider doing as well, is some kind of branch and price approach uh, where you use column generation. Uh, unfortunately, where if we write out the pricing problem for our formulation or a variable in our formulation, in particular at consolidation, you end up with a nonlinear pricing problem, which is not attractive from a computational perspective. So we instead had the idea of could we formulate an integer program that is like our consolidation based formulation, but is based on just a subset of the con consolidations that would exist in a full instance, if you will. And can we formulate that integer program such that it's a relaxation of the original problem, okay? And then we can use that in what I would call sort of an integer programming based column generation type algorithm. So this is a simple schematic, if you will, of how the proposed algorithm works, right? At each iteration, we solve an integer program that is fundamentally a relaxation of our original problem, even though it's formulated over just a subset of the potential consolidations, right? 
We check to see whether that solution is in fact optimal. If it is, we stop. If not, we discover new consolidations to add to our formulation. Uh, and then after that, we kind of do a simple primal heuristic. Uh, and then ultimately we just iterate, right? So if you think about branch and price, it'd be uh, almost the exact same framework. The difference would be that the, instead of solving an integer program, you would solve a linear program, right? Uh, and in discovering new consolidations would involve solving some kind of pricing problem, right? Maybe through dynamic programming or something like that. So the relaxation here is kind of the big idea, if you will, uh, or, or what takes a little bit of thinking. So to give you some intuition regarding how it works, right? Imagine we've got these four commodities, right? Each of which has a size. Uh, and then in the table next to it, we have all the potential consolidations of those commodities, uh, given that there are respective time windows, which we're not gonna go into any detail. That we're just looking at a single arc right here. And now suppose we just have the subsets of consolidations in the table to the right and ignore the S under bar for now. To formulate a relaxation, the way I generally approach this kind of thing is I want to be able to take solutions to my full problem and I wanna have a way to map them to solutions to my relaxation, right? Because if I can do that, if I can map every solution to my full problem to, my solu to a solution to my relaxation and in such a way that the cost doesn't go up, right? Then fundamentally my, my problem over here is a relaxation, right? That, that's kind of how that works, right? My feasible region is bigger, right? And my cost function uh, isn't overestimated uh, in, the, in the relaxation problem. So suppose I wanted to be able to map this optimal solution to this potential solution to my relaxation. Uh, what you'll notice here, right, is now uh, we have some constraints in our original problem that are violated in this mapping. And so in particular, right, in this potential solution to my relaxation, I've got commodity three that appears in two consolidations, right? That logically doesn't make sense and it violates a constraint of our original problem. We also, so notice we're choosing consolidation one, two, three, which requires two vehicles in, in reality and consolidation three, four, which requires one. So combined, I would really need three vehicles to transport those two consolidations. But in fact, in my solution to my relaxation, I only have two. And then finally, I've got one and three in the same consolidation, chosen consolidation, I should say, but they're dispatching at different times in the solution. Okay. So when I'm mapping solutions from when I have all my consolidations to just a subset with this technique, which we don't really need to worry about how that works, I'm losing some information regarding my problem, right? And so what we have to do is formulate our relaxation where these constraints are formulated or instantiated, I should say, a little bit differently. So the main idea behind this relaxation is that with because some consolidations are missing, right? The relaxation will be allowed to choose consolidations that contain commodities without forcing them to dispatch at the same time or requiring as many vehicles. So our, our objective function is the same. Here, right, we are allowing the relaxation to choose multiple consolidations that contain a single commodity. Here, the constraint has the same form, but the data is slightly different. I'll explain what that S underscore, how that's computed in a second, but fundamentally, it's an underestimate of the number of vehicles needed for a consolidation. And then here, we're only requiring commodities to dispatch at the same time for a subset of those in a consolidation. And then the rest is basically the same. And then there's a small little detail. Uh, you need to ensure that in your subsets, you have the maximal consolidation, meaning the one where there's no greater, if you will. Uh, and if you do that, then you can prove that this is a relaxation. So where does our little S under bar come from? So the idea here, right, is I've got this bigger consolidation that's potentially you serving as a model, if you will, for consolidations that have fewer shipments, but are not present in my relaxation, right? So in this case, consolidation one, two, three could serve the same purpose as consolidations one, two, or two, three, which are not in my current set. So what we're doing is we're associating with this larger consolidation, the number of vehicles you would need to transport the consolidations that are smaller and not present. So in reality, one, two, three should need two vehicles, but in our relaxation, we're only requiring it to cover one or need one, 
because then it could actually be serving the purpose of consolidations one, two, or two, three. So that basically allows us to map with these new constraints set and with this new data element, this S under bar, we can map the solution to our full problem to a solution to our relaxation. So to discover new consolidations, I think I'm gonna skip over this. This is pretty straightforward stuff. It's also in our paper. Uh, to search for primal solutions, fundamentally, if you kind of step back and think about it, what's going on in our algorithm, right? We've got sets of consolidations, right? We can just periodically solve the consolidation-based formulation as an integer program with the sets that we have so far. So how does it do? So we tested this on the same instances as we'd used before, right? And what we also did is dynamic discretization discovery, right? Can be easily adapted to, to the service network scheduling problem. Uh, and so what do we see? We see that in fact, both the dynamic methods solve all the instances, whereas the static ones didn't. The dynamic being uh, DDD or this, what we're calling integer programming based column generation. Uh, DDD is much faster, right? It needs about 4% of the time uh, from when you basically enumerate the time expanded network. Uh, but our integer programming based column generation algorithm is, is even faster, right? So it needs about a third of the time of, of DDD. So we can solve basically all the instances up to 500 commodities uh, on average in less than 30 seconds. Uh, if we look by number of commodities in the instance, right, we see that even with 500 commodities, we're able to solve in just a little over two minutes. So the algorithm seems to work quite well. Another parameter driving our instances is we've studied whether or not adding time to the delivery window, meaning the difference between the available and the due time, how that affects the performance of the two algorithms. We see that our consolidation-based formulation does a little bit worse as the time windows get wider which is not surprising because as the time windows get wider, there's potentially more consolidations, but it still performs better than DDD. So from a service network scheduling problem, right? It seems fairly clear that these consolidation-based formulations are, are effective, right? Of course, that presumes that the shipment paths have been determined a priori, right? And if you're interested, there is a paper that we've written about this. Uh, and so you can find it fairly easily. Right, but then the next thing we wanted to look at is, all right, can we take this same consolidation-based idea or formulation idea and use it for the scheduled service network design problem? Um, Debji, do I have like five minutes or so? Yeah, you have more time. You have at least okay. uh, 20, 20 minutes. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, all right, great, great. Yeah. Um, so if you recall, right, the scheduled service network design problem, right, is, is what we've talked about, but now also the optimization problem is choosing the physical path for each commodity, right? And so what we're gonna pre present is a consolidation-based formulation for this problem, uh, but we are gonna make an additional assumption, which is that the carrier has already identified a set of potential paths for each commodity. In my experience, this isn't so uncommon, Right, so basically in, in many industrial projects I've worked on, right, a carrier will say, you know, I only wanna route a, a shipment on one of its 10 shortest paths or eight shortest paths or something like that, right? So of course, in theory, you could generate the paths dynamically, but we're not, not gonna worry about that. So let's think about how we can model the, the scheduled service network design problem via consolidations, right? So everything that's here on the slide so far, as, as is indicated, right, is the same as before. We have the same three sets of variables, right? And, but we also have more, right? So the first is we have a binary variable that captures whether or not we choose a given path for a given commodity. Then we have a constraint that says you have to choose a path for each commodity from one of its set of potential paths. There's nothing really conceptually new or, or exciting here, right? And then here, this is where uh, we have to start syncing or keeping the paths chosen and the consolidations chosen sort of in sync, right? So what does this constraint say? It says, that if I choose a path for a commodity that contains a given arc, then I have to choose a consolidation that contains that commodity for that arc, right? That, that's all. Now, to be clear, these constraints here are not sufficient. We also need to make sure that our dispatch times, our gamma variables agree with basically when the commodities are, are available, when they're due, and then the travel times through the network. 
So with the SNSP, because the paths were given, right, they were determined a priori, right, we could write out these constraints here, which were fairly straightforward, right? The dispatch time plus the travel time, right, can't exceed uh, the subsequent dispatch time. Now, when we're choosing the paths, right, we can capture the time window aspect, right, with these constraints here, right? So alpha and beta represent the time window for a given commodity on a given arc, given a path, right? And so what we can say with these two constraints is that if I choose a given path, it basically creates my time window constraints for when a commodity can dispatch on a given arc. So that's fairly straightforward. And so is this. So we also need to capture the fact that the dispatch time plus the travel time can't exceed the subsequent dispatch time. And we can do that with these constraints here, right? So the left-hand side represents the time that commodity K arrives at node J. Notice the sum over the paths there, right? Because I really only want this constraint to have an impact if a path is chosen for K that contains arc IJ. And then the right-hand side is just the time it potentially departs J. So this is correct. Uh, you know, we'll get the same solution as a classical time expanded network formulation, right? The downside, as you can imagine, from for these consolidation based formulations is uh, the all the consolidations you might have to enumerate. That gets even larger here, right? Because there's multiple paths that a shipment can potentially take, right? And so that's why we also had the idea of sort of a hybrid formulation. So now uh, the idea here, think about having partitioned the arcs in your network, such that some of them you model as a physical arc with consolidations, and some of them you model as a time expanded arc, if you will. Or put another way, think about something like this, right? Or hopefully this image kind of captures what we're thinking. So the arc from H to I is in our set F. These are our quote unquote flat arcs. <coughs> and the arc from J to L is also a flat arc, right? So for those arcs, we're going to capture dispatch times with gamma variables, continuous variables. Now, I to J, suppose that's a hub to hub move, right? So there's lots of potential shipments that could be traveling on that move. So there's lots of potential consolidations, far more than we'd want to potentially enumerate in a static way, at least. We haven't done anything dynamic for this problem yet. All right, so that one we're going to capture with a time expanded network, okay? So now what do we need, right? We need to kind of adjust our formulation such that now we've got sort of newish flow balance constraints that represent that I could be entering node I, for example, from a node on an arc, I should say that's where dispatch times are measured with uh, continuous variables, as well as on arcs where dispatch times are measured via arcs in a time expanded network. But it's actually, once you've decided to try and model things this way, it's, it's actually fairly straightforward. So for our pure, if you will, consolidation-based SSNDP, we had these constraints up here. For our hybrid, right, now what do we have? So now we're thinking about departing from the origin, right? There's some earliest time at which you can depart. And so on the left-hand side, I've got two, two sets of quantities, if you will. Right, the first set is the dispatch time if I depart on an arc that's in the time expanded network. And the second, the sum over the gammas, is the dispatch times if I'm considering arc, if dispatch times associated with arcs where I'm not modeling with the time expanded network, basically just with continuous variables. And so once you kind of get your head around that idea, everything else kind of follows uh, pr pretty naturally. So basically, your dispatch times now are basically a sum of arcs that could be on a time expanded network and then dispatch times uh, in, the, in the flat network. So, so that's kind of the, the main idea there. What we found in terms of doing the actual partition is that what makes sense is to just simply look at the different time windows for orders on each lane uh, and put some threshold. So if, for example, uh, lane Chicago to Atlanta, oh, Debji, yep. It's a quick question, uh, Mike. Did you also consider the delays at the concert, for consolidation? Like how much time they're waiting to get together? Is that also a kind of a, like a penalty or any kind of cost with that? Uh, no. Uh, so there's really no, yeah, there's really no cross stocking time in this model, nor is there any penalty for storage, if you will. Um, but I guess we could. I hadn't thought about that, to be quite frank, because we could just determine the difference 
Yeah, right. between, de between departure and the arrivals, so and that will give you some time. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so finally, and maybe I had too few slides, I don't know, but so we tested this idea also, but again, purely now at this point, we're just looking from a static formulation basis to try and understand whether these consolidation based formulations are computationally effective. Uh, we considered instances with up to 250 commodities. Uh, we also varied the number of potential paths per, per commodity in the network from five to 10, right? And then we thought about three different approaches a time expanded network, straightforward idea, right? What people in generally do, not DDD, because we're just thinking about static formulations right now, the pure consolidation based formulation, and then the hybrid consolidation based formulation. And what we found is that our hybrid approach it actually enables us to solve more instances than either of the two. Uh, it allows us to solve them in a build and solve, right? So with our, these consolidation-based formulations, it's also important to factor in how long it takes to build an instance, right? But for the ones that you could build and solve, the pure consolidation-based formulation actually solves much, much faster, right? So the takeaway, I guess, where I'll say we are right now is this idea of using consolidations, particularly in a hybrid way, uh, seems like a... a uh, seems promising, if you will, in terms of solving the scheduled service network design problem, but there's certainly more to do. And the only things we've done in the context of the problem where you also choose paths is, of course, static, as I presented here. A dynamic method is likely uh, going to be much more powerful. But like I said, promising, but more work to do. So that's really all I had uh, to, to talk about today. Thank you for your attention. So as I said, the initial idea that service network scheduling problem, we have a paper written about that. You can uh, find that on HAL. My, my collaborator likes to use that platform. Uh, and there should be, I think, you know, a paper written about uh, using the consolidation-based idea for the scheduled service network design problem. I think we'll be done with that by the end of August. Uh, and please feel free to, to reach out if you're interested. So, so that's all I had. Thank you very much for your attention. Great. Uh, so thank you, Mike. We have a question as well, and I think more questions will come as we discuss a few. Uh, so Niharika asked this question, do you also consider vehicle types that can probably help to calculate the CO2 emissions as well? Um, no. Uh, let me think about whether we could. Um, yeah, yeah, we could. Uh, but so the trick there, yeah, so we could, right? So we could have different Y variables that, that measure the use of different vehicles, right? So that's certainly true, right? But just having that alone, right, wouldn't really be, so, well, I guess you'd have different Fs, right, to correspond to different transportation costs. So yeah, we certainly could do that. Um, yeah, yeah, we could do that. A, a related question, uh, Mike, that I have is that, can we typically in practice you would expect uh, the vehicles to move to certain, for example, think about uh, you know the relocation problem, right? Uh, a house relocation problem. So how they do is that they take your house products, they take to maybe a hub, and after some time they'll take to another hub, and uh, they might move your stuff from one vehicle to another vehicle to consolidate stuff, right? So yep. is this network solved uh, dynamically every time time or it is like a static over all time windows? Right now it is static across all times, right? I'm not sure I'm following what you mean by dynamic so, or static. So for example, here, the problem that you're solving is a static version where you have, you're solving for a large instance across yep. a time, time window yep. and you're solving it also deterministically, right? Which is yep. fine. Yep. But what I'm saying is that in practice, the location of the truck, the, the consolidation requirements can evolve over time, right? Ah, because yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, I see. Uh, right, so like a dynamic service network design type problem. Right, yeah. right, because you will only know after going to that location that there's another truck waiting somewhere else from where you can actually yeah. consolidate or whatever. So it's also possible to move, take it to dynamic, dynamic version, right? So. Yeah, uh, so I guess the best I can say is that I'm working on that uh, with some other folks. Okay. Uh, what I'll say is um, our approach is not, 
an operational type approach. So once you start thinking dynamic, right? And once you start thinking real time, right? There's just a lot of very messy operational constraints, right? You know, you got a lot of driver rules you got to worry about, et cetera, et cetera. So the approach that we've been looking at is more of a policy kind of approach. Yeah. Where the goal is to be able to say, all right, if I've got freight in Chicago uh, this much, right? Uh, in a rolling horizon framework, right? You want to look at routing it to Atlanta as opposed to Memphis, because generally speaking, when you get freight to Atlanta, it consolidates better. Yeah. Right. So we want to identify that kind of policy more than developing an algorithm that you would literally solve every day at 6 p.m. Um, gotcha. Yeah. yeah. Okay, that's cool. So there's another question Hussein asked, uh, could you please explain the consolidation with an example again? I didn't take oh. some your initial slides, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> sure. Uh, like this one? Yeah, probably some initial conservation. Yeah, this one. Okay. Uh, so, right. So it, it takes me a while to think through how to explain this. So uh, if you're familiar like with, with optimization, right? So generally speaking, if I want to formulate one problem uh, to be a relaxation of another, right? One approach to doing that is to formulate this problem over here as having a larger feasible region than my original problem, right? So it's like it's contained. Uh, and in such a way that when I evaluate my objective function of my problem over that enlarged feasible region, right? It, it underestimates or doesn't overestimate the actual cost of each solution. Right, I think Mike, uh, what he was referring to is the basic problem of conservation itself. So I think it was one initial slide which you had uh, where you had the arcs and conservation. Probably like this one. Even before, did you have a another example of the consolidation as a the problem that you're trying to solve? And this is one good. This is a good one. Yeah, and this will help. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So just simply the idea is, and yeah, maybe I, I should have talked about this in a little bit more detail. The idea. So what's going on, right? Actually, maybe the best way to talk about this, if we go back to this picture. Right, so here we have two consolidations, right? Yes. The one on the left, right? I, let, imagine each of these pallets is a shipment, right? A different shipment, right? So the one on the left, right? This is a consolidation of shipments, right? The one on the right is a different consolidation of shipments, right? So the idea is that to capture the capacity needs, right? We're gonna model uh, with enumerations of these potential consolidations. So a priori, right? Not getting into the dynamic part yet. We're going to say, sorry. You know, when I route stuff, pardon me, right? When I route from Chicago to Atlanta, I've only got one consolidation available, right? It's shipment one. However, when I route from Atlanta to Tampa, right? There's different ways in which I could consolidate my shipments, right? I could have shipment one go on its own, I could have shipment two go on its own, on its own, meaning in a separate vehicle, right? Or I could have shipments one and two go together, right? Uh, in which case I may need more than one vehicle, but I, I may not, right? And then from Tampa to Miami, again, it's the same idea. It's all the different ways in which shipments could be transported on a physical move, right? Either on their own or potentially with other shipments. Uh, and then the corresponding vehicle needs for each of those consolidations. Does that help? That answers, absolutely. Okay, okay. All right. <laughs> thank you for the question. I, I, I probably, I think about this a lot, so I probably gloss over uh, yeah. some stuff a little bit too, too quickly. But. Because one more question, I'm not sure, do I understand myself fully, is how the methodology will help to solve for flexible routing problem? Uh, I, think. I would need to know what a flexible routing problem yeah, is. Yeah, I think it's, it's, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's a bit big, but I think what, what I can guess is probably um, if there is a route disruption or something, I'm not sure, are, are we able to move to another route probably, but it's just speculation, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not quite sure, so. Yeah. I mean, yeah. obviously, uh, maybe uh, the question could be, uh, how could this be adapted to handle uncertainty? Um, yeah. That we haven't yet worked on, so <laughs> that's, yeah. But it's certainly on our minds, if you will. Great. 
And there are several other questions, but I'll just say is that presentation was awesome. They really liked oh. it. They enjoyed your uh, discussions as oh. well. So I think uh, if there I, are any other questions, please uh, let us right away know. We are we have a few many more minutes with Mike. If there are any other questions or thoughts, yeah, and I should say I didn't put my email address up, but uh, I'm sure you can get it from Debjeet if you're if you want to see yeah. the slides. I'm happy to share them, so that, that's no problem. Great, great. Uh, but in general, Mike, uh, about our center again, we would love to host you virtually, but oh. more importantly for India, we would love to host in person for sure. Oh, wonderful, and uh, and hopefully. Uh, we can also think about you know panel discussions where you can you can have you as a moderator other ways to collaborate so we'll we'll figure out ways yeah yeah that'd be fantastic uh yeah. I, I mean i've i've w, you know we've really not had a chance to interact a lot in person but i'd certainly like for that to happen uh i mean you've obviously done a lot of great work uh and seem like a very nice person too which are two two important things uh and then i'd love to i've never been to india so that'd be fantastic please wonderful wonderful so thank you all for joining our uh, research webinars we keep hosting in ctl multiple topics uh, we host also panel discussions so hopefully you'll be benefiting from our work but more importantly also discussions that we have so thank you again mike for joining us this evening and your morning early morning rather and we are thrilled uh, to have you okay that's the final question looks like <laughs> oh, wonderful uh, from Ehsan, Ehsan has a question is, can we integrate uh, strategic decisions like hub locations into the SND or SSND problem? Yeah, um, not a lot of people do that, or we, I mean, I, not a lot of people have done that, you know, so there's certainly hub location models, but they don't generally capture uh, the consolidation of vehicles, uh, or I'm sorry, of shipments uh, super precisely, uh, but you certainly could do that. I think actually what's a bit more interesting to me, and not that what you're, the problem you're describing isn't interesting, uh, is hub capacity, right? So I feel like I, I seem to see a lot in the news or talk to carriers about, I can, I can get new facilities, I can add on fairly easily, right? What I need to know is how many doors do I need? Or another example would be, imagine I'm not a carrier, but I'm a 3PL. Right. And so I don't really own any of these assets, but I'm just trying to figure out which ones to rent. Right. And how much capacity to rent at each cross dock. Uh, that's where I think actually an integration of kind of a facility location and a service network design model makes a, a heck of a lot of sense. Yeah. Fantastic. But it's also just uh, it's a great opportunity because people don't seem to be working on that. Uh, so, yeah. Wonderful. Thank you again, Mike, and thank you all the audience for joining us uh, this yeah. particular talk, and hopefully to see you in the future again. So yeah, thank you. Indeed. Thank you. Thank you so much.